Today is July 23rd, 2013. We're at the Dhammasukha Meditation Center with Bhante Vimala Ramsey, and he will do tonight Majima Nikaya number nine, Samaditi Right View. Okay. <coughs> Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove and at Pindika's Park. There he addressed Venerable Sariputta. There, excuse me, there the Venerable Sariputta addressed the monks thus, friends, uh, they replied, yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Sir said, one of right view, one of right view is said, in what way is a noble disciple one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering conf confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma? Indeed, friend, we would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Sariputta the meaning of this statement. It would be good if the Venerable Sariputta would explain the meaning of this statement. Having heard, heard it from him, the monks will remember it. Then, friends, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the monks replied. The Venerable Sariputta said this, when, friends, a noble disciple understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, in that way he is one of right view. What is understanding the unwholesome and the root of it? Boy, is it quiet in here. <laughs> it is seeing things personally taking them personally and the root of that is craving in that way he is one of right view whose view is straight who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma and what, friends, is the unwholesome? What is the root? What is the wholesome? Which, what is the root of the wholesome? Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Misconduct and sexual pleasures is unwholesome. False speech is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome. Gossip is unwholesome. Covetousness is unwholesome. Ill will is unwholesome. Wrong view is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. What is wrong view? Why is it unwholesome? You, you can talk. <laughs> what is wrong view and why is it unwholesome? Taking things. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Because there is craving in it. It all comes back down to anything that you take as being personal. This is me, this is mine, this is who I am. That is wrong view because everything is impersonal. It doesn't matter whether it's physical or mental. Everything is impersonal. It happens because this is the way it, it, the conditions are right for it to happen. Oh 
boy. <clears throat> what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is the root of the unwholesome. Hate is a root of the unwholesome. Delusion is a root of the unwholesome. And what is that? Greed, I like it. Hatred, I don't like it. Delusion, I am that. In other words, it's another way of saying craving. This is called the root of the unwholesome. What is the wholesome? What is the wholesome? Abstention from living, killing living beings is wholesome. Abstention from taking what is not given is wholesome. Abstention from misconduct and sensual pleasures is wholesome. Abstention from false speech is wholesome. Abstention from malicious speech is wholesome. Abstention from harsh speech is wholesome. Abstention from gossip is wholesome. Uncovetousness is wholesome. Non-ill will is wholesome. Right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. Now what he's actually talking about is the four precepts. That's what he taught. Monks later added the fifth precept about alcohol and such. <clears throat> and what is the root of the wholesome? Non-greed is the root of the wholesome. Non-hate is the root of the wholesome. Non-delusion is the root of the wholesome. Letting go of craving is the wholesome. This is called the root of the wholesome. When a noble disciple has thus understood the unwholesome, the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome, the root of the wholesome, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view con and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. Abandoning ignorance means seeing how the links of dependent origination actually work and how the Four no Noble Truths are a part of each link. Too many times uh, teachers just lightly say, well, it's suffering and, and there's a cause and there's a cessation, but they don't understand the depth of what the Four Noble Truths really is talking about and how it's used. In that way, to a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands nutriment, the origin of nutriment, the cessation of nutriment, and the way leading to the cessation of nutriment. In that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is nutriment? 
What is the origin of nutriment? What is the cessation of nutriment? What is the way leading to the cessation of nutriment? There are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that may, that already have come to be and for the support of those about to come to be. What for? They are physical food as nutriment, gross or subtle, contact as the second, formations as the third, and consciousness as the fourth. With the arriving of arising of craving, there is the arising of nutriment. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of nutriment. The way leading to the cessation of nutriment is just this noble eightfold path that is harmonious perspective, harmonious imaging, harmonious communication. Harmonious movement, harmonious lifestyle, harmonious practice, harmonious observation, and harmonious collectedness. When a noble disciple has thus understood nutriment, the origin of nutriment, the cessation of nutriment, and the way leading to the cessation of nutriment, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to greed. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to, view, to the view and conceit I am. By abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way to a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has ar arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understanding suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is suffering? What is the origin of suffering? What is the cessation of suffering? What is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Sickness is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are suffering. This is called suffering. And I always add in one little thing to that. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. To obtain what one doesn't want is suffering. My. <laughs> and what is the origin of suffering? It is craving which brings renewal of being is accompanied by delight and lust and delights in this and that that is craving for sensual pleasures craving for habitual tendencies craving for non-habitual tendencies this is called the origin of suffering <coughs> And what is the cessation of suffering? It is the remainderless fading away and ceasing. 
the giving up, relinquishing, letting go and rejecting of that same craving. Craving is a source of suffering. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. When you become an arahat, it's gone completely. Well, because a phrase here, it's a remainder that's fading away. Every time you six R, it is the remainderless fading away because a new one will come up later. It's not the same craving. So remainderless just fading away. Right. But because of our old attachments, our old habitual tendencies. Uh, we have craving arriving often. That's why I try to tell you during your daily activities you need to stay with your object of meditation and 6R when there is a distraction. Okay, and that includes smiling. I, I really don't understand. Of course, I've been teaching this for so long, it's, it seems obvious. But why people insist that meditation is supposed to be serious and you're not supposed to have a light mind. Smiling is one of the ways that you get to a light mind. Your mind is very agile when you have joy in your mind. But Mahasi Sayada is very good or was very good and they, they still teach it that way that you have to be careful of joy because you can become too attached to it. But it's one of the awakening factors. It, just because it arises doesn't mean you have to get attached to it. But they say it in such a way that they you, you have the desire to push it away. And that is a wrong view as far as I can see. It's really kind of a strange thing. So many people are so, they're trying so hard. The, you, the Zen people, they're trying to have a clear mind. And then when they do, they don't know what to do with it. There's so many different forms of one-pointed concentration where you're bringing that craving back to your object of meditation without ever being able to recognize it. <clears throat> it's really a problem, especially in this country. Asians seem to pick it up much faster because <clears throat> I suppose it's because we're more goal oriented and whoever is teaching meditation is teaching it as a serious thing but you're finding out now that when you're serious your, your meditation isn't so good when your mind is light and you keep backing away and not taking things personally and letting things happen by themselves then it's it's simple to do it would be a really nice thing to start seeing a lot of different teachers talk about the simplicity of meditation when I first started 
I tried to learn meditation. I would go to people that were practicing it and they'd say, well, just sit down and meditate. And that's the only instructions I got. I'd go to the Zen center, just sit down and clear your mind. How do you do that? You're supposed to figure it out on your own after a few years. Does that match what the Dhamma, the uh, good qualities of the Dhamma say? Is it immediately effective? I mean, the first time that you sit and you six R something, you see that it's immediately effective because your mind is clear. There's no thoughts in it. There's no tightness in it. <clears throat> and you're teaching yourself more and more how all of this thing that we call life works. How it arises. How it ceases. How thoughts rise and cease. Do you ask yourself to start thinking about things? Or does it just pop up into your mind and then you start thinking about it? But there's an awful lot of people that are more into you've got to be absorbed into your object of meditation. That's the only time you can have good meditation is if you have a nimitta, <coughs> a sign where your concentration is really good. But even that, is that immediately effective? Does that, is that onward leading? Or is it just getting caught in one thing and staying there. Well, of course it is. Because they don't know how to recognize craving and they're trying to force their mind to polishing that craving in yeah. into a perfect glow. Yeah. Yeah, they are. And what is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path. This is called the way leading to the cessation of suffering. When a noble disciple has thus understood suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering, he here and now, makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delight and delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. <coughs> there certainly is, sir, or friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands aging and death, the origin of aging and death, the cessation of aging and death, and the way leading to the cessation of aging and death, in that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is aging and death? What is its origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation? 
the aging of beings and various orders of being, their old age. Old age can be just the end of one round of dependent origination. It doesn't have to be the end of life. But there can be the the uh, the end of life too, the brokenness of teeth, the graying of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties. This is called aging. The passing of beings out. <sighs> Pages stuck together of the various orders of being, their passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time, dissolution of the aggregates, laying down of the body, this is called death. So this aging and death are what is called aging and death. Now this particular thing is also in the same Utnikaya. <clears throat> but they're leaning heavily on the Visuddhimagga with this translation. And Venerable Buddha Gosa divided the lengths of dependent and origination into three lifetimes, which, depending on your perspective, can be right or not. <coughs> it can be the lifetime of one round of dependent origination and that way it can it can be fairly close to being accurate but the way most people take it is in general terms and that's not very accurate then so we have to be careful with this particular kind of translation. With the arising of birth, there is the arising of aging and death. With the cessation of birth, there is the cessation of aging and death. The way leading to the cessation of aging and death is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood aging and death, the origin of a aging and death, the origin of a the aging and death is birth. If there was no birth, there would be no aging and death. The cessation of aging and death and the way leading to the cessation of aging and death he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then he asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. You like the way I changed that? <laughs> when, friends, a noble disciple understands birth, the origin of birth, the cessation of birth, the way leading to the cessation of birth, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is birth? What is its origin? What is its cessation? What is the way leading to its cessation? The birth of beings in the various orders of beings. Their coming to birth, precipitation in a womb, generation, manifestation of the aggregates, Obtaining the base of the basis of contact, this is called birth, with the arising of <coughs> habitual tendency, there is the arising of birth. 
with the cessation of habitual tendency there is the cessation of birth the way leading to the cessation of birth is just this noble eightfold path when a noble disciple has thus understood birth the origin the cessation and the way leading to the cessation he here and now makes an end of suffering in that way too a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma saying good friend the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words now when we're talking of birth we're also talking of birth of action and that's what generation is talking about there <coughs> and when they're talking about aging and death that's just the first part of it it's sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair and that makes a lot more sense when you're practicing uh, being able to see how the links actually work so you have a birth of action you do something you have a pain and you want to get rid of it and you start moving around that's the birth of action your emotional response to the pain is the cause of the action of the birth and the sorrow and lamentation is the cause of the birth is the cause of that <coughs> then they ask him a further question but friend might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma there certainly is friend when friends a noble disciple understands habitual tendency the origin of habitual tendency the cessation and the way leading to the cessation in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma and what is habitual tendency what is the origin what is the cessation what is the way leading to the cessation there are these three kinds of habitual tendency the sense sphere habitual tendency the sense sphere habitual tendency is your emotional reaction you catch that David yeah. e e emotional reaction yes. okay the fine <coughs> fine material and the immaterial fine material is when you have a fine material body and when you have a fine material body that means that you're in a deva loka or <coughs> even in a hell realm you have a fine material body this is a gross body when you leave this body you still have a body and it's fine material in other words you don't see it with an, at, in this dimension <laughs> and the immaterial realm is a mental realm only okay. with the arising <coughs> excuse me with the arising of clinging there is the arising of habitual tendency with the cessation of clinging there is the cessation of habitual tendency 
the way leading to the cessation of habitual tendency is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood habitual tendency, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way too, noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. As saying, good friend, amongst delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words, then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might, uh, there certainly is, friends. Almost got caught. <laughs> then, friends, when, friends, a noble disciple understands clinging, the origin of clinging, the cessation of clinging, the way leading to the cessation of clinging, he, <coughs> in that way, he is one of right view and is. <coughs> arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is clinging? What is the origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation? There are these four kinds of clinging. Clinging to sensual pleasures, clinging to views, that's the one I use most, your thoughts, your opinions, your concepts, your ideas, and your story. Clinging to rites and rituals, and clinging to a doctrine of a personal self. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of clinging. You already know that. You've been doing it a lot. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of clinging. With the arising of, cra of craving, there is the arising of clinging. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of craving, uh, of clinging. And the way leading to the cessation of clinging is just this noble eightfold path. <coughs> Every time you use the six R's, you're using the entire eightfold path at that time. So it's real interesting. And every time you smile, you're using the eightfold path at that time. There's a lot of applications for the Eightfold Path. And because I'm kind of a sneaky monk and I want you to find out things on your own, I don't tell you about these things until later, after I get you to do them for a while. Maybe you have your own insights into what you're actually doing. But... <coughs> the way that I'm showing you agrees with the suttas. And every time you use the six R's or smile, you are practicing the eightfold path, all of the folds of the eightfold path at that time. When a noble disciple has thus understood clinging, the origin of clinging, the cessation of clinging, the way leading to the cessation of clinging, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. 
When, friends, a noble disciple understands craving, the origin of craving, the cessation of craving, and the way leading to the cessation of craving, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is craving? What is the origin of craving? What is the cessation of craving? What is the way leading to the cessation of craving? There are these six classes of craving. Craving for forms, craving for sounds, craving for odors, craving for flavors, craving for tangibles, craving for mind objects. With the arising of feeling, there is the arising of craving. Now remember, feeling is not emotion. Feeling is just a pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. With the cessation of feeling, there is the cessation of craving. The way leading to the cessation of craving is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood craving, the origin, cessation, and way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. <coughs> Every link has a little bit of craving in it. The craving that we just went through is the bigger, grosser kind of craving. But there is still that subtle, I am that, in each one of the links. So you have to 6R each of the links. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands feeling, the origin of feeling, the cessation of feeling, the way leading to the cessation of feeling. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is feeling? What is its origin? What is its cessation? What is the way leading to its cessation? There are these six classes of feeling, feeling born of eye contact, Feeling born of ear contact. Feeling born of nose contact. Feeling born of tongue contact. Feeling born of body contact. Feeling born of mind contact. With the arising of contact, there is the arising of feeling. With the cessation of contact, there is the cessation of feeling. The way leading to the cessation of feeling is just this noble eightfold path. <coughs> when a noble disciple has thus understood feeling, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friend. When, friends, <coughs> a noble disciple understands contact, the origin of contact, the cessation of contact, the way leading to the cessation. In that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is the contact? What is the origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation? There are these six classes of contact, 
eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. With the arising of the sixfold base, there is the arising of contact. With the cessation of the sixfold base, there is the cessation of contact. The way leading to the cessation of contact is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple is one who understands contact, the origin of contact, the cessation of contact, the way leading to the cessation of contact, he is here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Contact <coughs> let's say at the eyes. In order to see you have good working eye. Good working eye hits color and form. Eye consciousness arises the meeting of these three things, the internal form, the external, and the consciousness. That is what is called contact. Okay? <clears throat> and because of contact, that's why I say that consciousness is the potential when we get to that. Because it needs to have the good working ear, the sound, the ear consciousness arising. Okay. Saying, good friend, amongst delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands a sixfold base, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is the sixfold base? What is the origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation? There are six bases, the eye base, the ear base, the nose base, the tongue base, the body base, and mind base. With the arising of mentality, materiality, there is the arising of the sixfold base. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, there is the cessation of the sixfold base. The way leading to the cessation of the sixfold base is just this noble eightfold path. <coughs> When a noble disciple has thus understood the sixfold base, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands mentality, materiality, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation, in that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. <coughs> and what is mentality, materiality? What is the origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation? Feeling, perception, formations, contact, and attention 
these are called mentality okay feeling you think is physical but it's not it is mental it might arise because of a physical sensation that's why when you hear me talk about uh, thoughts arising feelings arising sensations arising they all cause con the craving to arise I use those three for very specific reasons because that shows that there is feeling perception uh, that's different right that's something different altogether The four great elements <coughs> and the material form are derived from the four great elements. These are called materiality. So this mentality and materiality are what is called mentality, materiality. With the arising of consciousness, there is the arising of mentality, materiality with the cessation of consciousness there is the cessation <coughs> of mentality materiality in the way leading to the cessation is just this noble eightfold path when a noble disciple has thus understood mentality materiality the origin the cessation and way leading to the cessation he here and now makes an end of suffering in that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him for a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, sir, friend. When, friends, a noble disciple understands consciousness, the origin of consciousness, the cessation of consciousness, <coughs> and the way leading to the cessation of consciousness, in that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is consciousness? What is the origin of consciousness? What is the cessation of consciousness what is the way leading to the cessation of consciousness there are these six classes of consciousness eye consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness mind consciousness <clears throat> with the arising of formations there is the arising of consciousness with the cessation of formations there is the cessation of consciousness the way leading to the cessation of consciousness is just this noble eightfold path when a noble disciple has thus understood consciousness, the origin of consciousness, the cessation of consciousness, and the way leading to the cessation of consciousness, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. In order for consciousness to arise, there has to be a cause, and that's the formations are there. But <clears throat> there has to be one of the sense doors coming up for that consciousness to hook onto. So because it says back on the basis, I am the 
individual form is arising by consciousness, but the same here, that they're high consciousness. It, it is there, but it's the potential of it for it to arise. It can't arise by itself. There has to be something helping it. That's why contact is important to understand. They, listen to what I just said. It's the potential for that to arise. It has to have something to ring it. Okay, you always have eye consciousness, even if you don't have eyes. But it's not going to arise until good working eye hits color and form for that consciousness to come up at that time. is mental. Mental. Vedana is mental. Right. And these the potentials are there. But they have to have additional things there in order for that to arise. Is what? <laughs> as uh, as um, vaporware. vaporware is what I said. And, uh, um, potential is potential as opposed to something that would be potential. It, it means that it's available when the conditions are right. If you don't have that potential, then... It I guess for me it's not, it's not, it's not feeling so much like 12 dots wind up in the world. No. Yeah, so it's a lot that comes in and goes in. Well, I can, yeah. Okay. Because it, because it, it does say that, so you got this stuff coming in here and you see this, that's not going to happen. Well, well but you, you're thinking in a linear way. Yeah. And well, that's, well, well, it, 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 it depends on. Can says this is, is, this gives rise to this, you know, so this season, this doesn't appear, and this season, that doesn't appear, and this season. So that does sound very linear. Well, but when you let go of consciousness, then the rest of them will not arise, right? And when you let go of formations, none of the other links will arise. So it's linear and it's not linear at the same time. Well, yeah, it's kind of like the physics of, of a, a wave and a... And a Got a 
when it comes together, when the conditions are right. But it isn't, it isn't like this, right? It's, it's just this, and it's just, it's just all. But you can drill down to that, 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 that That's the new Dhamma word for the day. <laughs> So consciousness, what, what, when, when there's contact, what it means is nama rupa is there, and consciousness is there, and that leads to the other stuff arising. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you okay? I'm grabbing pieces. Okay, good. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands formations, the origin of formations, the cessation of formations, and the way leading to the cessation of formations, in that way one is of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What are formations? What is the origin? What is the cessation? What is the way leading to the cessation of formations? There are these three kinds of formation. Bodily formation, verbal formation, and mental formation. These again are potentials that still have craving in it. That's why it arose. That's why you have three different kinds of stem cells. Basically. <coughs> you told me you did. Yeah, no, I could see the see the formation, but we're talking about three different kinds of formations. I just you know, the the seed coming in and then something will happen and it might become this and become that. But they all look the same as they rose out of nothing. Yeah. As opposed to three different stuff. I you know, I, 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 I must say Bhakti, I'm I'm a little suspicious that uh, there's what the Buddha taught and then has it gotten memorized and put in form and reinterpreted stuff. Some of it's got a little Well, that's true, but this is pretty much uh, I haven't run across any translation that hasn't been body, speech, and mind formation. Okay. So how do I know? Well, it, it seems like you can see it, but it's not the same. I mean, here we go with words again. Yeah. yeah. Bodily formation, verbal formation, and mental formation. That is the potential for body, speech, and mind to arise. Okay? And here we go with the word potential again. And it, is, it, is it correct? Well, it's right. Is it absolutely correct? See it for yourself and tell me. See, I didn't follow Yeah. Which means something that is being formed. Yeah, that, that's... That, that, that makes more intuitive sense. Sankara 
is probably the biggest word in all of Pali. It has many, many, many different definitions and it gets real complicated. I understand that the root of it, tar, in this action of sana, means it's got extra force, and so the, the word literally means, you know, give it a form, which, which to me makes sense for all the, the definitions. It's like, it's like, it's like the sandcastle. kind of like that definition and I kind of don't like that definition because it's not encompassing enough. Yeah, it's it's still it's like you get the origin of the word and then how it's actually used, you know, may drift a lot from the origin, but, but for me that at least kind of uh, was a starting point for the word that actually made a lot of sense. Mm. Anyway <coughs> With the arising of ignorance, there is the arising of formations. With the cessation of ignorance, there is the cessation of formations. The way leading to the cessation of formations is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood formations, the origin, cessation, and way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question, but friend, might there be <coughs> another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands ignorance, the origin of ignorance, the cessation of ignorance, the way leading to the cessation of ignorance, in that way he is one of true, uh, of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is ignorance? Its origin origin, its cessation, and way leading to its cessation. Not knowing about suffering. Not knowing about the origin of suffering. Not knowing about the cessation of suffering. Not knowing about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called ignorance. With the arising of the distractions, there is the arising of ignorance. With the cessation of distractions, there is the cessation of ignorance. The way leading to the cessation of ignorance is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood ignorance, the origin, cessation, and way leading to the cessation, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Saying, good friends, the monks delighted and rejoiced in venerable Sariputta's words. Then they ask him a further question. But, friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. There certainly is, friends. When, friends, a noble disciple understands the taints, the origin, cessation, and the way leading to the cessation. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived, and whose 
one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what are the taints, the origin, cessation, and way leading to the cessation? There are these three taints. That is the taint of sensual desire, the taint of habitual tendency, and the taint of ignorance. With the arising of ignorance, there is the arising of the taints. With the cessation of ignorance, there is the cessation of the distractions. The way leading to the cessation of distraction is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood the distractions, the origin, the cessation, and way leading to the cessation, he entirely abandon, abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am, and by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. He threatened the monks within an inch of their life if they asked if there was yeah. another... <laughs> That's not in my <laughs> I'm not questioning that. <laughs> And then you get scolded by him. <coughs> yeah. Nutriment means food. What you feed, that grows. If you feed the formations, the formations are also thoughts, right? So you keep entertaining the same thoughts over and over again, and they get bigger and more intense. And <clears throat> that's why I talk to you a lot about not keeping your attention on one thing. As soon as a distraction arises, you let it be, relax. Now you've changed your nutriment. You've taken it away from the, uh, the distraction, and now you're feeding the cause of it and you relax and then you smile and then you're feeding the smile and then when you come back to your object of meditation you feed that more and when you feed that more it stays longer okay anyway let's share some merit may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.